How come the clock isn't moving? That's a good question. <laughs> How about that? Now we got the clock moving. So who do we have here so far? We've got, we've got Mike Wiesner, who missed our program last night because I came on so late. <clears throat> he says, yippee, happy new year, everybody. Aaron Thompson, Tim Myers, um, he's back. Uh, Carlos Hernandez, hello, Scott, and everyone. Nice to have you on, Carlos. Uh, uh, Tim's glad it's Friday. Ballantine Nelson David. Isn't our universe amazing and beautiful? Yes, it is. Uh, and Thomas Walker from the UK, big smiley face. Um, in caps, Aaron Thompson, Happy New Year, everyone. And uh, Tim Myers, at Explore Scientific, you have been missed. We missed you guys, so we missed you guys a lot. All right, Jerry, I sent an email out to that guy um, that Wes was talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just waiting for him. I'll just, I just told him to respond to me personally at work on the work email. Oh, Cameron Gillis says, hello from the Pacific Northwest. My first time joining live. Excellent shows, by the way. Thanks Good. for joining, Cameron. That's great. Norm Hughes is with us. I like positive feedback. Yes, Jenny Bedell Shelley's with us too. That's great. Um, Eduardo Jose uh, Yancos from Brazil. 
I love this international audience. It's so cool. Michael Whitaker, good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you are healthy and in good spirits. Yes, we are. Um, Book Davy says, howdy, howdy. Sandy Fincher, hello. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> um, it's great. Hope you guys, uh, wherever you are, you're getting some clear skies this weekend. Here in Arkansas, it looks like it's going to be cloudy for a little while and cold. Don't you don't you say that evil evil cloud that you, evil cloud word? Say that, that evil c word. Don't don't mention it. <laughs> It'll clear up around twelve a.m. That's, <clears throat> that's prime time imaging. Beverly Mab Morton says doing well. It's great. You guys just keep staring into this vanishing star field and let the peace flow through your body. <laughs> Aaron Thompson, tonight and tomorrow will be clear for the first time in weeks. Twenty twenty one promises to be a fruitful year for ESA and the European space industry. This year, we'll see the launch of a new and innovative telecommunication satellite called Quantum, developed through a public-private partnership with UTELSAT. Quantum is the first satellite that can be reprogrammed in orbit for maximum flexibility. Another first in 2021 will be the maiden flight of Vega C. This new iteration of the Vega launcher is more powerful and allows for larger and heavier payloads than the current Vega with which it will share a launch pad. Vega C's third stage motor will also be used as a strap-on booster for Europe's new heavy lift launcher, Ariane 6. The development of Ariane 6 will continue in 2021, working towards the launcher's inaugural flight in 2022. Never dying, both Vega C and Ariane 6 will be cost-efficient and reliable launch vehicles ready to compete in the worldwide launcher market, confirming Europe as a front runner in spaceflight, while also securing independent access to space for Europe. Exciting news for Galileo, Europe's global satellite navigation system. In January, the contract for the development of the second generation Galileo satellites will be signed. Europe will also launch two first generation Galileo satellites on a Soyuz from Kourou in 2021. These satellites are set to serve as backups or replacements for the oldest Galileo satellites. As humankind continues to face the challenge of climate change and our impact on the environment, Earth observation continues to be a cornerstone of ESA's activities. The agency will carry on operating 16 Earth observation satellites monitoring our planet. Through these programmes, over 250 terabytes of data are distributed to users across the globe for scientific and operational purposes. In the coming year, ESA and the European Commission will also decide on the expansion of Europe's successful Copernicus Earth Observation Programme. In 2021, two ESA astronauts will launch to the International Space Station. Thomas Pesquet will start his second long duration mission in spring. His mission is called Alpha, after Alpha Centauri, the closest stellar system to Earth, following the French tradition to name space missions after stars or constellations. In autumn, German astronaut Matthias Maurer will fly to the space station for his first mission called Cosmic Kiss, which represents the love of space. Matthias was the most recent astronaut to join the ESA Astronaut Corps and finished basic training in 2018. In 2021, ESA will start recruitment to find suitable candidates for a new astronaut class. Aboard the ISS, both Thomas and Matthias will spend a lot of time in the European Columbus Laboratory, performing hundreds of experiments in zero gravity. ESA will continue to collaborate with NASA in human spaceflight with the ongoing development of NASA's Artemis I mission. The Artemis I mission will see the first flight of the new Orion capsule with ESA's European Service Module, ESM. The Orion spacecraft and ESM will become vital for human spaceflight, 
as they will fly astronauts to the future lunar orbiting gateway, in which ESA is one of the contributing partners, but also to the Moon or even to Mars. While it might be a while before humans set foot on it, the exploration of the Red Planet presses forward with the continued development of ExoMars, ESA's Mars lander and rover, scheduled for launch in 2022, and the Mars Sample Return Mission in collaboration with NASA, that aims to retrieve samples from our neighbouring planet. A lot further into space, ESA's spacecraft BepiColombo and Solar Orbiter will perform a near simultaneous flyby of Venus in August. It will be the second flyby of the hottest planet in our solar system for both spacecraft. Bepi Colombo is on a seven-year journey to Mercury and Solar Orbiter will be the first spacecraft to study the poles of our Sun. Science will also see the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope on top of an Ariane 5 from Kourou. This infrared telescope will study every phase in the history of our universe, ranging from the first luminous glows after the Big Bang to the formation of solar systems capable of supporting life on planets like Earth. Closer to home, ESA's Fly-Eye Telescope yeah. will be tested and validated at Matera Space Centre in Italy. This telescope has been specially designed to scan the heavens for near-Earth objects such as asteroids, which could potentially be a threat to our planet. June 2021 will mark the end of an era, when current ESA Director General Jan Werner ends his tenure. Jan became ESA Director General in July 2015. At the time, he was the head of the German space agency DLR. With Jan as Director General, ESA saw a number of achievements, like securing a record budget at the Space 19 Plus Summit in Seville, Spain, and a renaissance in Europe's space industry, due in large to Jan's insistence that the private sector should play a larger part in Europe's space ambitions. Now it will be up to a new Director General, Josef Aschbacher, and a younger generation to take over and lead the European Space Agency into the future. Well, hello everybody. Uh, this is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and this is the Open Go To Community Live. It is our 117th uh, episode and is our second season. So yes. Scott, it finally your your camera finally focused on your face. You were all blurry there for a minute. That's because I am blurry. <laughs> I was blurry for a minute. That was actually sharply focused. Okay. <laughs> you were My sitting there vibrating really fast, and it was, was blurred. Like, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, no, it's so great to be back with you guys. Um, you know, I did a little uh, coming attractions uh, yesterday, just announcing that we're coming back on for our daily show. And it was so fun to see all these people like logging in from all over the world and stuff. So um, maybe I was on late enough for some of the people on the other the other side of the planet to see us come on live. But um, anyhow, this is our normal programming time, and uh, uh, so it's it's nice to uh, to be here today. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people said that they missed us. Well, we missed all you guys. So, you know, so I, we all hope that you had a, a great holiday season. Uh, you know, 2021 has started with, of course, a bang. But uh, we are, um, uh, you know, I'm in, we're in, I'm calling it the Roaring Twenties is what, we're, what I'm calling it. Yeah. I know that name, that era was actually already used, but... Uh, but it seems uh, maybe appropriate for the, this era as well. Uh, we have an exciting year um, planned already uh, with Explore Scientific. Um, uh, it was a crazy uh, uh, holiday season, unlike, unlike any other holiday season that our industry has ever faced before. And I'm not just talking about because of the pandemic, um, 
but maybe because, in one way, because of the pandemic, and we've touched on this many times in our show, is how much uh, interest it's driving in astronomy. And uh, uh, so, you know, the whole concept of personal exploration, personal discovery from your backyard, you know, socially distanced already, um, you know, in many ways, um, you know, but, but still joined together by sharing and, and, and doing what we do online, uh, uh, you know, it makes it one of the really um, great uh, things that you can do during this time. Uh, so um, anyhow, uh, our business was up by many times uh, over what it was last year. Uh, uh, I mean, last year, 2019 versus 2020. So that has caused like this tidal wave of interest in not only buying new equipment, but also we, because people buy, buy equipment, occasionally they have to have something serviced or they have questions, that kind of thing. And that has really kind of impacted our customer service as well, big time. Tyler, what, what, what can you say about, about all of that? Mm. We've been fairly busy. Fairly busy is an understatement. <laughs> With is an understatement. We do also have some people that are out uh, for various reasons, um, uh, you know. So uh, you know, and and uh, we had um, we had a customer who had been waiting for a long time to try to reach through to us, and finally did. But he was going, "Gosh, why don't you guys just hire somebody? Just hire some people." You know, you can't just hire people in our industry. They have to know something about what? They have to understand something about telescopes, you know? Uh, we can't just have somebody pick up the phone and, and not be, in, uh, you know, not be able to really converse with you about uh, which end of the telescope that you are uh, looking at or when any of our products. So it does take time. Um, I recall joining Mead Instruments in 1986 now, I was selling Mead product as a retailer, okay, for many years before I joined Mead Instruments. Even though I was a retailer and knew the uh, parts list and the product list and, you know, was already running an astronomy club and all the rest of that stuff, it still took me one year before I understood all the systems and things that I had to do as a customer service rep for Mead Instruments in order to really work with customers. So it, it took a while. So you can't just like jump in and start doing the job. Um, and it's, uh, it is also a volatile uh, industry. There are times where we have like these ultra highs mm -hmm. and then on the other side of that is like, boom, you know, it's, it can be like a cliff drop, you know, and business shrinks and drops back, hire a bunch of people. Guess what you have to do when, you have the cliff drop, okay? Or, or there's a big reduction in business. You have to let them go, okay? And, and I'm so that's, that's something that none of us like to do. And so, uh, you know, uh, but uh, if you're having a tough time getting in touch with us for any reason, you know, just, I ask you to bear with us, um, you know, continue to uh, go through our, mostly our email system right now, uh, or our, our uh, uh, support sync system, which you can mm -hmm. find uh, that's at the bottom of the page. Isn't that right, Tyler? Yes, it's on the bottom of our web, pie, web page. I, yeah, so, you know, it's just, we, we have limited resources right now, and um, uh, but we are getting to everybody as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Tyler's burning the, the candle at both ends uh, to make this happen, so. Um, I mean, if, if they can't get through, if, if they feel like they're not getting satisfactory email responses, they can just email me directly if they want. Yeah, uh, if that's something that they want to do, it is Tyler at explorerscientific.com. Mm -hmm. Now, again, please bear with me. As Scott says, I'm, ban I'm burning both ends because I'm trying to do Kent's job and everything else. And everybody's yeah. blowing my phone up. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And, and starting this weekend, you're going to start to see me also in those emails. So, um, uh, you know, and if you anybody needs uh, uh, help personally, you can just you can text my cell phone at 949-637-9075, you know. And I'm Scott will tell me. Close. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I'll give you Tyler's home phone number and you can call uh, him. No, so, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm I'm kidding. So. Yeah. <laughs> if they want that, they got to come see me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. 
So anyhow, um, uh, let's look at some of the comments uh, here. Um, uh, Marco Pola is watching as well. Uh, hello, nice to see the live stream back. Um, Norm Hughes, lots of laughs. Explore Scientific must have plugged it in to see, to test to see if it works. Great. Um, uh, Norm says, welcome back, Scott and gang. Hope that you had a great vacation. I certainly did. Um, uh, Richard Grace, like right now, my cam is in the backpack, so to go camping tomorrow. So I, I'm not going to let you leave, Tyler. I said that I would let you come in and come out, but we're not going to let you leave after. <laughs> I got to get to shipping. I got to ship stuff. I got to help ship it out. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're gonna let you talk for a minute and then I'm going to let people log in. Okay, I'm gonna give them the Zoom login and we're gonna sing happy birthday to you. No, you're not. It is your birthday. And if you leave, uh, then, you know, I'm gonna deduct something from your paycheck. Okay, so. <laughs> Crap rolls downhill. I'm the bigger hill than you. It's, it's, the, an <laughs> it's the anti present. <laughs> That's right. Uh, let's see. Jenny says, uh, Jerry's got a new background for a new year. Uh, Michael Whitaker, my ASI Air Pro comes next week. Oh, boy. Michael, prepare for a huge weather system to come in, okay? Uh, Tyler, I'm still okay to reach out to you when I'm ready to sort the yeah. PNC-8 out, question mark? Go for it. Yep, okay. Go for All it. Right. Uh, Charles M. Lewis, Happy New Year's, guys. Um, <coughs> Stefan Del Pra, hello. You know, everybody's saying hello, it's great. Happy New Year, hello. Uh, Longbow29, what's Jerry got in store for the next generation of mount? Oh. Okay. Oh, well, that's uh... Well, hang on, before we get down that road. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll let you talk about that later here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to announce, and then I'm going to have to get off here, is the winners have been selected for the astrophotography contest. So, again, bear with us. We're, we're getting everything sorted out that we need to get sorted out. And then expect an email soon for all the winners. I'm not going to name any names on who won. So, you're going to have to bite your nails and hope. Right. But they have been selected. Mm -hmm. um, 123 participants. A lot of great stuff came in. A lot of great stuff did come in. Was it? A, it's 123 images, right? Not participants. Yeah, 123 images. I apologize. Sorry, still the all-knowing. Oh Lord. <laughs> Gold. Hi, James. Hey, how's everybody doing? Happy New Year. <laughs> Dusty. James, now, this is something you're not supposed to do during these shows. It's just throw out the you know the Zoom login <laughs> to the world. <laughs> but that's what we're doing today. So, you know. Y'all are killing me. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow. Now I'm gonna give you just a few more minutes. Tyler, um uh what what else can you tell us about the uh the astrophotography contest? What what are the uh what are the what? What's the what's the juicy parts here? Expect people to win. Expect we people. had we had uh, we had Im we had images in each category right at the end of the we did. day. We we did have a lot of images. All the categories were filled. Uh, there were some of the great transjunction that was in there. Um, time lapses. We even had a picture with our presser bird feeder camera. Right. Yes. One got. Uh, it was actually Jennifer Shelley got a picture of a Carolina chickadee. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's Cool. And a squirrel. And a squirrel, huh? Okay. We got more people joining in. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I did not sign up for this. You sneaky, sneaky man. You. That's what I, so who else we got on? We got Dusty. We got Mick's iPhone. Mick's, Mick, Mick Whitaker. Mick, Mick Whitaker. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Anyways, how old are you now today, Tyler? I'm 35 still years young. Yeah, that's pretty young. Actually, it's kind of like, you know, right almost at the crest. Careful, the hill, right? You know what it looks like on the other side of that? <laughs> Nothing but a downhill ride. That's, that's uh, it's scary, man. <laughs> my son just turned 37, my oldest. Oh, yeah. So It's not that old. I mean, come on, you know. No, Dude, you're young. You got kids that are grown that are probably my age. That's right. All right. 
Okay, so I know you got to go, so we're going to sing happy birthday, man. All right? Okay. Happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, dear Tyler, to you. <laughs> happy birthday, happy birthday dear you. Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday to you. It's a love internet latency. Happy birthday I've ever heard. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Love internet. There's Dave. Hey Dave, how are you? Uh, and, and Aaron. Hi Aaron. Oh, there's Astro Beard. I we'll have to do it again now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, okay, Tyler, where else could you go in the world? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Tyler. Happy birthday, Tyler. How's it going? And Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Oh, there's Astro Beard. I'll have to do it again now. <laughs> I do what I do right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you feel? Happy birthday to you. There's a little puppy there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thank you all for logging in and helping us sing uh, Happy Birthday to Tyler. Uh, we're going to let uh, Jerry take it from here. I, Tyler needs to get back into shipping. Um, but uh, congratulations on reaching 35 uh, years strong, you know, so Let's see we really appreciate all that you do. Let's see if Scott will let me reach 36. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that stretch from 35 to 36, man, is... Oof. Like lighting a fuse, you know, it just goes quick. Mm. So, yeah, y'all take her easy. <laughs> take care, Happy Tyler. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Tyler. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All righty. All right. So, um, uh, we're, I'm going to turn this over to Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you are, uh, here we go. Um, we were talking about uh, uh, picking up on the mentor training. Uh, you right. and I talked a little bit about um, uh, some of the uh, new um, software that you've been working on. So, Right. I've been working on some updates uh, over the last, actually, couple months, three, two or three months, actually, um, along with uh, another project that I, was a main project. But... Uh, Everybody knows Wes McDonald on the forum. He's uh, he's a great friend uh, of ours, and he's he helps me a lot. Um, and I've been working with him to do upgrades to the firmware, which are pretty significant. So I'm going to get a little bit into some of the functionality, but it, but this is going to be a significant uh, upgrade. And it's it's good for not just our new products that are coming out this year, but also for everything, everybody that's bought anything that's PMC8, they'll be able to use this firmware uh, to add all these new features. And the other neat thing is that it's a, it's a universal, that was the main goal was to create a universal version of the firmware. So you don't have two or three, four different versions for the different mount systems. Uh, that was a big goal to, to help us maintain a common code set uh, going forward. And it makes it easier for us to make changes and to make them for every product that's out there. And our primary goal is to maintain backward compatibility uh, so that we don't orphan anybody. Any new features that we come out with going forward should be able to be backfit into customers' equipment that they bought three years ago. Right. Don't you wish everybody did that with everything? I mean, yeah, it takes a little bit of work, but uh, fortunately we've, we've, we've been able to do a pretty good job of uh, with the initial system design to do that going forward. So uh, some of the features that some of the main features that we're adding to the firmware also are ease of use features. All right. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and I don't know that we've announced this other product yet either. 
So there's a feature that we developed that everybody will very much appreciate that is going to be take is going to be used by another product that we're going to release here in the next few months uh, that people in Europe have been asking for. Um, so I'm not going to, I don't know how much you want to say about that product, but I don't want to, I'm not going to say anything right now, but the feature is that there's no longer going to be a requirement to switch back and forth between serial and Wi-Fi. They'll bo both be available simultaneously. All right. So that's a big, that's a big thing. So you'll be able to connect up the Explore Stars to your Wi-Fi or the ASCOM driver without yeah. doing anything. Okay, that's the basic function. You'll also be able to communicate at the same time. So you can actually have Explore Stars running against the mount out in the yard, right? Mm -hmm. when you go out and look at it and then you can come back in the house with your ASCOM driver on your computer and be controlling them out that way at the same time. At the same time. That's cool. That's cool. So that's a good feature. Yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah. That's a, that's gotta be a bit of a trick. I mean, it so. is, it's, there's some marshalling of the communications and things like that, that we worked out and got, yeah. we have it working now. So, right. See, that's, I mean, that's a feature, that's a beautiful feature and, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, was born from the open go to community. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, something, something that's going to be incredibly useful. Um, and, um, you know, to be able to jump back and forth like that is, uh, right. is free, you know, because, uh, most of the time you have to configure something either for wireless or wired and, uh, um, Right, you're kind of restricted in that way. You're not yeah, really uh right. Yeah. So, I remember working at Meet Instruments and you know, we wanted to do a wireless system, but it was kind of like, I mean, we would have all the same uh, you know, conversations that we had at the beginning of this, you know, well, you know, Scott Pickett, you know, what is it going to be? And of course, you know, we want everything. Uh, <laughs> to get everything ain't easy. So No. Right? No. Yeah. Well, especially if you go down a path with the design mm -hmm. and you haven't built in or you don't you don't think you have the flexibility you, where you have to design it over from scratch again to add another feature that really gets messy. Um, yeah. So it's hard to do that uh, when you've when you've grown the system up organically. It looks like if anybody's ever done programming and seen what spaghetti spaghetti code looks like. Yeah, where you kind of layer stuff on, and it wasn't really designed I, to do this, I, but you kind of—I know what it looks like. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's so weird. you can't even follow it, you know. Right, so. you can't follow it. And you you have a hard time. You don't have any margin to add any features. You have to pull things out. Pull it. You have to basically pull this stuff apart, and then put it back together. Right. It's like a bunch yeah. of bundle of wires that you have to untangle. Yeah, it's like that. that <laughs> it's like those extension cords that I have over in my cabinet over here. You know. Yeah. You, one out and this whole ball of stuff comes out right exactly um, spaghetti code <laughs> yeah right so right. uh but we didn't do it that way so we did it i think the correct way to where we could add these things going forward michael uh, whitaker is asking when when is this update coming uh but uh, we didn't say when it's coming it is it's it's close it's the, it's very close uh i can say that it's pretty much feature complete in terms of the prototype firmware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You just have to go through testing now. Yeah. And I've, I've got a pretty comprehensive test plan. It's not going to take us all that much to do all the testing. We just have to go through and test everything to make sure we didn't break anything, of course, mm -hmm. of the standard stuff that already works. And then we have to make sure all the features work as designed. Now, and the other thing that I'm working on that uh, I'm going to have a certain level of documentation available at the same time we release this. So that's what I'm concentrating on right now is getting all the documentation up to speed. There's going to be a new uh, manual right. similar to the old one, but it's, I renamed it. Um, I think it's, it should be more approachable for people. It's called the uh, PMC8. Uh, let me go to it. Let me share it here. Yeah, I can tell you what you called it. I wrote it down. 
Can you see that? Yeah, there we Let go. Zoom up. Let me zoom up on it. Yeah, it is the user reference and programmer's guide. It's a PMC8 user reference, and that's and the emphasis is on user and is a programmer's guide. Okay. Previously, it was called the PMC programmer's reference, PMC8 programmer's reference, which kind of throw people off. They didn't, they don't, I don't want to, I'm not a programmer. I don't need to look at that. Right. But you should look at that. Uh, this is, this is an important document that really has a lot, a lot of answers to questions that people have day to day. And also the details, if you really un want to understand how the thing works, this is, uh, this is the, the document for it. Right. So, um, this, so I'm working on this documentation update. As you can see, I've already started working on it with this name change and some other, there's a lot of other things in here that I've already changed and updated, but uh, I'm gonna stop my share again. So having said that, the question was, when, was, when are we gonna release this? All right, so after our initial round of testing, alpha testing that Wes and I are doing, we're going to release it for company beta testing mm -hmm. for our employees, our, our team. And then I'm probably going to be, we can release it for beta testing for users out there that want to get in on it. And they have to be Alliance members, right? Yep. That's one of the benefits of being an Alliance, uh, an Explorer Alliance member is you get, get an opportunity to test beta software and other things and you can you can join the alliance at the free level so that that would allow you to do that right so uh if anybody's interested in doing uh some testing with this new firmware uh let me know and send me an email at jrh at explorescientific.com and i'll probably do an announcement on the forum for that also sure uh but you heard it here first. Did, so yeah. one of the other things that uh, that's just that's just one of the basic major upgrades that we did. Now the other upgrade we did to, in order to make this a universal set of firmware, the thing that differentiated between the mounts was the motor current settings. Okay, <clears throat> those different mounts have different drivetrains and different motor sizes. So mm -hmm. the way we handle this now is that uh, there's a set of limits depending on the mount type that you can set the, the motor current to and it allows the user to set it. And there's, there's two, there's two current values now. Also there's a tracking current and a slew current. So the tracking current is meant to be set lower than the slewing current. And uh, that's user settable within limits that we define uh, so that you can maximize your battery life out in the field. So it's really a battery management tool that you can use as a user yourself to set your motor currents. If you think you got your mount tuned up really good with the gear train, you know, it's got, got nice and smooth and uh, then you can, can afford to set your motor current a little bit less, okay, than what to extend your battery life. If you have, uh, if you've got uh, some issues with a certain, uh, that night the temperature changed or something and you're starting to get a little bit of problems with the motor driving the system, you can set it up higher and overcome that in that session. So you don't have to sit there and call us and say, this thing's not working now. There's a workaround that you can use temporarily to increase the motor current to overcome that issue. And then you can go to the long-term fix by contacting us and help letting us help you adjust your mount uh, that way. So, it's just a, it's just another tool for the user to be flexible and to be able to overcome issues that, that people run into the field. Uh, so that's a, that's a big change is the motor current settings uh, are there. Uh, there's gonna be a new ASCOM driver release along with this new firmware. Uh, again, the ASCOM driver uh, will be backward compatible. Even if you do not upgrade the firmware, You'll mm -hmm. still be able to use this upgraded, I believe. I'm not, I may be talking out of turn here. I'm, I'm trying to make it so that you can use a new ASCOM driver without the new firmware. Let me put it that way. 
that may not be the case. I, we have to go through our testing and see how much we're going to do that for. But for the most part, it should work. Um, but you'll want to take advantage of the new firmware anyway. Yeah, that's right. Um, what else? So to get back to the question about when we're going to release this, right? I, I expect by the end of, uh, I would hope that by the end of January, it'll be available. Definitely before the end of January, the beta testers will be out there testing. And we'll be talking about it as we do our daily show and, and let you, you know, give you updates as to where we are. So, right. Um, yeah, so that that's great. And, uh, you know, this upgrade will be, uh, you know, a free upgrade. So, yeah. That's, that's another benefit there. So it'll be awesome. Free upgrade. Uh, yep. So anyhow, uh, that's great. Um, uh, are you, uh, Jerry, are you at a point now? Because I think that you kind of hit, hit sort of like an end point of uh, part of the mentor training uh, segment that you were at. Yeah. So the draft document that I posted up on the forum that everybody uh a few people have been looking at and commenting on um i i've got the end of that document i've you know i haven't spent a lot of time continuing on with that document i need to do that also i've got that's my biggest problem right now is i've i've let the documentation lag quite a bit on, on all the different stuff so i've got to really hunker down and start concentrating on documentation and that includes a mentor training documentation Mm -hmm. Now, this mentor training was created for us to do our in-house training, which, uh, you know, Scott mentioned earlier that, you know, you don't just become a customer rep right off the bat. It takes some time and effort to learn the equipment. And we're doing this training with our uh, customer service reps to, uh, to help them quickly get up to speed on our, mainly on the PMC-8 system, but also anything related uh, to that uh, using the as an astrophotographer or whatever you would use. Um, it's really training on how to be an astrophotographer, not just for PMC-8, although we concentrate on the PMC-8 in terms of the details and the operations of certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what the training was meant for. And it was meant for not just our customer service reps, but also our dealers eventually, and then our customers. And you guys kind of get a sneak peek of it as what you're getting. And that's the way it is with this document. So in our training that we've done with our customer service reps every Friday, we discontinued it. Well, we, we suspended it for a little while the last month, but we're gonna get back into it next week. And uh, I've been continuing that training with uh, sections of my book, uh, Scientific Astrophotography. I've been covering the chapters in there. And that's, you know, I think, uh, I could I could continue that this way do do different talks yeah. fifteen minute talks on different no, sections of my be book because that follows along with the rest of the training that we've been doing yeah um, and it talks about a lot there's a lot and that's mainly an equipment manual and and a, and an equipment uh, configuration and use manual is what the the scientific astrophotography uh, book is um, for those who let me let me go ahead and uh, bring that up on my browser so everybody can see what I'm talking about here. I know a lot of you probably have seen it already, but I, I just want to, um, give me a second. All right. So share my screen. Where's it at? You see, you see that? Yep. All right. So this was uh, published uh, by Springer Books. And it's available on Amazon. 
you look up my name on Amazon, Gerald Hubble, you'll find it. Uh, both of my books that are out there. This is the one though that's uh, that's really the one that gets into details, and I can, can give you an example of what it looks like here. Actually, I can show you. Let me share something else here. I've got it here. Forgot about it. Whoops. It's the wrong one. <laughs> That's my Word document. It's not my. <clears throat> what happened to my PDF? I'm just going to share my screen and bring up the PDF. How about that? Sure. All right. There it is. Okay. So there was, this is what the book kind of looks like. Let me scroll up to the top. All right. So there's the, there's the cover. And so what I'm going to probably go in forward in this training is I'm going to go through the different sections of my book. That'll be great. So. And, uh, oh, look who, look who did a, a forward for me. He was kind enough to do that. <laughs> Mr. Scott Roberts. <laughs> no charge. You'll, yeah, that's right. You 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 want you want to read that. You you want to have that. So that's the whole reason to buy the book is right there. Yeah, you, if you guys have trouble sleeping at night, you can just read this part of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm going to just go through a little bit of the. Uh, how many days you want to be sleeping continuously? Right. Right. Uh huh. Oh, I, so this just to give you an overview of the book. This is some of the stuff we could be where we're going to be covering. All right. Uh, right. And talk I, about. I also want to tell you guys, this is not an explore scientific puff piece. OK, this is this is how to put together, a, you know, an astronomical imaging system, as as Jerry has uh, has phrased it here. And it is it involves a process of critical thinking. OK to put together a system that will work, okay, based off performance and price and all the parameters, you know, and, and constraints as you see right here. Uh, and once you get through this, you might like rethink, oh, geez, you know, I've been, you can either confirm that you've been doing things right, okay, as far right. as, you know, uh, in putting together your system, or you might say, hmm, there's a little nugget of information here that I didn't even think about, okay, in order to do that. Now, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that you could add to this, but once you go down that path of critical thinking, then you've got kind of a, a process, a system that, that's going to make sense that you can take with you and, and build on, so. Right. And that's always important when you're selecting gear for, uh, you know, to do your um, your exploration of whatever it is, you know, whether it might be putting together a backpack full of all the gear that you might need uh, to, to go on a, a trek somewhere or in the case of astronomers to do this. Right. Exactly. So it's important. I know a lot of people when they first start out, it's difficult to get into this mode because you don't, you really don't know what you're interested in. So you kind of like, it's like grasping at straws on what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And you get the typical, uh, you know, excellent. It's there's excellent uh, advice out there on how to start out. Some people tell you to learn the sky with binoculars and with your naked eye first start out that way, spend a month or two learning in the sky, and then you can jump into telescopes. Other people say, no, if, if get into big, get a big Dobsonian so you can look at the deep sky stuff to try to turn you on to deep sky stuff right off the bat. Okay. No, I want to do planetary. I really like looking at the moon and the planets, or I'm interested in the planets because of the space program. Right. 
Uh, so I want to get into that. So you, you want to buy a long focal length refractor or maybe a Maxitoff or something like that to look at planets and the moon. You know, there's all kinds of advice out there. But again, as a beginner, you really, unless you've latched onto something you really, that drove you to astronomy to begin with, that's typically what you first want to get into. So it's either like Scott was enamored with uh, galaxies and, yeah. and stuff when he was a kid. That's, so that's why he got into the types of scopes he did. I, I started out, you know, with the Apollo program, wanting to know all about the moon. So that's what I was all about, all about get looking at the moon which is a different different telescope. So it just depends on what you're interested in. But once you've decided, then this is what you want to do. If you want to get serious about it and you want to save as much money and get the best performance out of your equipment that you can, then you start into this, into the book. And you learn about all the different equipment. Now, we not only go into, you know, I don't touch a whole lot on visual observing, although a lot of it can apply to visual observing. This is more, this gets deep into astrophotography and how, how to get the best performance out of your system. And I, like, like Scott said, there's critical thinking and there's an engineering aspect to this to where you want to design your and integrate your system towards, um, towards your goal. You want to get, you want to get the best bang for your buck. And that's what the bottom line is, right? That's right. That's right. You know, and the, no matter where you might be working or, you know, what, what, uh, 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 you know, how you might approach something. If you're, if your job is going to involve selecting gear to make, um, uh, to come up with a good result, uh, this process of critical thinking can be applied to all kinds of stuff, not only to your hobby that you love, but, you know, maybe getting something for your home, uh, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, the stuff to equip your house with or, you know, a problem that you may have to solve at work, too. It is just this process of critical thinking to approach a problem properly. And so these are the benefits. Once you kind of get into something like this, this is one of the one of the benefits of having a hobby. OK, that mm -hmm. you that you can, uh, you know, you can engage with people at many different levels of expertise uh, you know, Jerry, uh, you know, from his background is, uh, you know, working, working for nuclear power plants and uh, having to select gear and systems and methods and processes, uh, which involve a critical thinking path, okay, to make sure that they have something that's reliable, redundant, sustainable, you know, and cost, you know, has the right mm -hmm. cost to performance ratio. And so this is, this is uh, a part of it. Are there other paths to approaching this? Yes. Okay. And, and you would develop your own. But if you don't have one right now, this is a great path to start on, uh, to, to learn with. Uh, not only do you have the author here with you on a, a weekly basis, <laughs> but you have the book and um, uh, you can work with us as you, as you learn this whole, this whole process. Uh, we have some comments about your book. Um, Aaron Thompson says, I just need to say how great the book has been uh, to read so far. It's a very specific walkthrough of exactly what is required to manage a solid imaging system. Highly recommended. Um, well, thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so I get into, I, I, it's kind of anal in, in some respects. This is, this shows in my book that shows my, some of my nuclear background. And I, and I, in fact, that I go to the process of, uh, I go through some math, but I get to the point where I'm actually providing, if I can find it, I can't remember what yeah. page it is, but there's procedures. Not a mathematician and I'm not, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, you can, you can get help with it or actually not use it. Right. So there's procedures. There's actually procedures in here to step you through step by step. It's like a recipe. Yeah. We used to, you know, at the plant, <laughs> the nuclear station we used to talk about cookbooking stuff you know you've got procedures that tell you how exactly what you do on the equipment because you want you want consistent standard way of doing things when you test when you test the uh, equipment and when you when you do uh performance testing and when you do uh calibrations and all this stuff you want a, a way to do it that's been tried and true and documented and can stand through but that doesn't mean so we always said that no, no matter how good the procedures are, 
the technician and the engineer has to be smarter than the procedure so that he can find when there's a problem with the procedure. Mm. No matter how good the procedures are, no matter how many years these procedures have been used, mm -hmm. you still have to be able to know more than the procedure uh, to detect problems. And so that was my, you know, that was my training that I had. So even though I give you this, this cookbook of procedures on how to do things, it's more of a checklist than it is a procedure. Um, you still, I, I'm, you know, I like to see people when they, when they take the procedure as a starting point and then they study the equipment yeah. and what's involved and they know, then they learn more about the equipment based on than what the procedure tells them. Right. They take ownership of it and then they take, they, right. Mm -hmm. It's a great starting point to, to learn how to do that. So, you know, it's uh, as, as you start your journey, uh, you know, we're matching you up with a very experienced guy, uh, you know, Jerry Hubble here. And um, in this case, and, uh, you know, and, and our entire team, you know, and so, uh, but we are following this. I, you know, I highly recommend it as well. Um, so it's, it's, I think that you'll find it to be a, uh, uh, an easy read. Um, uh, it seems very detailed. It is okay, but you need to be detailed, uh, when yeah, it's, you're approaching it's, it's... your, your, your hobby, because, you know, uh, Jerry often talks about what is your time worth? Well, right. <laughs> you know, if you got a clear path lined out for yourself, you're going to reach, uh, your goals much quicker, um, you know, you're going to learn how to, like a pilot, you're going to learn how to uh, solve problems and have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D, okay, uh, so that you can you can work through uh, whatever issues that you might have. Um, That's it, important when you do an outreach. You know, when you do outreach, you're you're on the stage, right? You're up there, right. and you get equipment failures. You'll always get equipment failures. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and you see us live. I mean, so yeah, right. Something. And whatever we do kind of blows up in our face. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has happened. Uh, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, if you met us at a trade show or a star party, the same kinds of things can happen too. And, you know, we have to work through those things, uh, so that we have a successful, uh, event and we have a successful outreach and a, a successful teaching of, uh, how our systems work. And so, um, you know, it's not that ours are are uh, m any more complicated than than another system that might be out there. But there's a learning curve for all of it, and uh, you mm -hmm. know, so you know, we just want to be there for you uh, to make sure that you that you are getting the information that you have uh, that you need and a process that will help you through it when you know there's no one around and you're out by yourself. You know. Right. You can, it's easy to, it's very easy to get frustrated and it's, it's a knowledge gap is what it is. What it comes down to is a knowledge and experience gap. Uh, it takes a while to get through it. It took me a good four years of, of solid full-time work basically before I got to the point where I could write the book. Yeah. Uh, it was a, it was another full-time job that I took on early on. This is like 12, 13 years ago when I started this process and, um, you know, and it's continued from there. I've been very fortunate to be able to get in, get into this industry like I have. But, uh, uh, but again, if you if just stick to itiveness, you know, just keeping at it and understanding that there's going to be things that you're going to bump your head against and you're going to pound, you, you can waste, you know, even today when I'm working on stuff, I spend three hours of my life wasted trying to figure something out. And then I figured, and then I, I realized I did something stupid, you know. <laughs> Not plug something in the right spot, or well, something. it's just that you don't you forget you either forget something that you you found out you know a couple of weeks ago and you didn't write it down and you and then yeah. you re, then you remember it again yeah, and you yeah. say, oh damn, that's what it is. Yeah, you and know, by the way, like the that. higher in altitude that you go, you know, like some of us like to go to mountaintops to do observing, the oh, less yeah. oxygen you're getting to your brain. When I went to Mauna Kea, mm -hmm. uh, a professional astronomer said, Scott, okay, you're going up there. You're going to be working with bros. He said, write everything down step by step. He mm -hmm. said, you'll be amazed at how stupid you get at 14,000 feet, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and he was right, you know? So, um, 
you know, and I and I had this little this little you know you can buy those little books. Uh, uh, blank pages, and that's what I did. I just had had procedure after procedure. No notepad, yeah. And um, and this that's the other thing. This book helps you become organized in your thinking, and that's important if you're going to take if you're going to get into taking copious notes about different setups and different things, configurations. Mm -hmm. It's important that you're very organized, and uh, but the, just the act of writing it down and recording it helps you remember it yourself. Yeah. That's right. It's not that you have to always go back to your notes and think of something. You'll remember it, you it, know. It helps your memory. That's yeah. right. Building synapses or whatever it is that, that make that work. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Lewis says uh, that's the difference between training and education. Um, so it's uh, 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 Celtic Raven says, uh, I will say that on the 21st, I learned somewhat the hard way that Jerry really is right. Make a checklist confirm it and now i have one started <laughs> there are a lot of cables and cords when hooking up cameras computers and such that's mm -hmm. true you know color code things or write labels on things you know uh just so that you're doing things correctly and just one little tiny um uh, mistake can lead you down a rabbit hole that that can right. take a while to figure it out so yeah you waste an hour or two hours of your life just trying to remember or figure out what you did yeah, and you might miss some really cool astronomical event, you know, that uh, that is happening in that that period of time. So um, you want to you want to be there to capture it and, and to do it. So um, but that's all cool. And uh, so the next time that you will be on, Jerry, will be next Monday. Uh, we'll have you on Monday and Wednesday and Friday. And uh, mm -hmm. so. Um, until that time, uh, you know, for those of you, again, uh, for everybody that, that uh, logged in with us to sing happy birthday to Tyler Bowman, we really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are on deck with um, uh, the uh, Night Sky Network on January 14th for the next Global Star Party. And we have um, coming up on... Let me see if I can remember the date. I think it is that uh, the following or around the middle of the month, maybe I'm just going to guess around the 15th or so. Um, uh, it is uh, the Astronomical League live, their second presentation, and it's called the uh, uh, Shake, Rattle and Roll. It is about seismology in uh, the solar system. So it's really cool. Uh, and uh, uh, Terry Mann is uh, setting up this roster of speakers uh, that include uh, Caitlin Ahrens, uh, who's a PhD, actually living here in Arkansas, I think. So, uh, but she's done a lot of stuff with NASA, and um, so it's it's really cool. But until that time, uh, we are going to uh, wish you a great weekend. Uh, hope you have clear skies wherever you are, and. Uh, you know, keep looking up. Is there anything else you want to add there, Jerry? Nope. Uh, I think just, just keep looking up, like you said. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. All right. And where can they find your book if they want to buy it? So it if you, you can search for, you can search for Gerald Hubble on Amazon and it should pop up the two books that I have. Yeah, and uh, have the other one's called Remote Observatories for a Amateur Astronomers. Um, yeah. And or you can go to springer.com and search. Sometimes you search for my name, it'll come up with a couple things. Uh, and sure. just just for those who don't know, I was uh, I have a part time job working for Springer as a, I'm the series, the book series editor for the Patrick Moore series of books that this but my books were published under. So I was they they approached me two, three years ago to come take the place of, um, what was his name, of the fellow that retired um, to become the series editor. So I help authors uh, walk through the process of getting their book proposals made and uh, submitted to Springer is what I do, basically. Yeah, but uh, this is over the Patrick series, or it's Patrick Moore's series of books. And, I mean, that's an honor by itself. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's really cool. You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. uh, 
he was the he, he was the Carl Sagan before Carl Sagan. <laughs> so that's right. He was the so he was a series editor up until he passed away. You know, yeah. and he had his own television. He had his own television series for a long. Oh yeah, time on the BBC. So uh, you, you know, certainly in in um, in the UK, you mentioned Patrick Moore, and uh, the guy's legendary. So. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Um, Thanks again. I put up the link uh, for the um, for the Amazon link for your book, and um, uh, okay, thanks. It. You can follow along. Uh, Mike Wiesner says my ETX book editor was John Watson at Springer. Oh, John Watson. Yeah, that's right, John. Yeah. I, that's who initially got me going with John Watson. That's very cool. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Book Davy says the sky at night. That's right. That was the name of his program. Mm-hmm. You can watch those series, I think, still on YouTube, um, you know, so and maybe you can see if you go on the BBC website, you used to be able to watch this guy at night, uh, some of the archive series, and I'll bet they still have that. So anyway, you guys have a good w weekend and uh, we'll see you back on Monday. Take care. <laughs>